joining the reading of the stories. Yes, it looks like it's definitely of a gap between the farm and the reading of the stories.
Anuil Vrodira Kuyorith, my dear brothers and sisters. We are here as a congregation of the Welsh Church in New York. You'll hear some Welsh in the course of the afternoon. But don't feel awkward, most of it will be in English. As people of faith, we are often challenged to provide answers to the question, why? Well, we don't have any. But we have answers to is, we are here, we are here for each other, we are here for parents and friends who are grieving. And, and so, without wasting too much time from the front, please just look at the bulletin, follow along. We will be singing hymns that are in the hymnals in your pews, in English. There will be some Welsh thrown in. Be here to celebrate an amazing life. I last saw Paris sitting over there uh, at our Christmas service. And he returned my greeting with a strong, firm handshake and clear eyes and a lot of affection. And that carried on into the tea hour where he poured me a rather stiff fruit cup, which had more than fruit in it, I think. Um, and smiled especially well when I went back for a second helping because I obviously got the message. I will miss a young man with clear vision about things, things he liked, things he was good at. Um, amongst them, I think I will remember his people skills, a good, a good person. And so we turn now to our service. It will be partly a regular service of the Welsh Church, which means we will have prayers and we will have a brief homily, um, and in between there will be opportunities for people to speak and share remembrances and share affection. Let us pray. Agawni gyd wedi o. Daeon ar ddolwn ac ymgrymwn, plygwn ar ein gliniau ger bron yr arglwydd ein gwneith thiwrwr, Oherwydd e fe yw ein diw, a ninnau yn pobl iddo, a defaid ei borfa. A na'n dagrau a'n rhistwch diolch hwn, am y person hwn, a aeth hwn plyth. Cyflwyn nhw'n Paris i ti, gan ddiolch am holl awenydd a ddig. Ieraill, i deulu i ffrindiau. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord, our Maker. He is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Despite our sorrow, we thank you for this person whom you have received yourself. We commend Paris to you with gratitude for the joy he brought to others, to family, to friends, to neighbours. Please join in singing the first hymn after I read the Lord's, the Lord's Prayer, the 23rd Psalm. Join with me and read the 23rd Psalm if you wish. This is a translation which is not the classic King James Version. It's slightly more modern and hopefully maybe a little bit more meaningful. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. For even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil and my cup overflows with blessings. 
Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And now, hymn number 546, The day thou gavest, Lord, is ended, to the tune St. Clement's. Hymn 546 in your hymnal, please stand. seated. There are now three eulogies to be led by I was Paris's college guidance counselor and we bonded through an interdisciplinary course I taught that was right up his alley. At the Browning holiday party in December, we talked about an author that I had introduced him to, and I gave him a copy of his recent book. Paris said he had ordered a book for me and thought I would appreciate it. He told me he was pursuing a doctorate in the history and philosophy of science, and I told him, you are living my dream. A week later, he was gone. I would like to read something I wrote 11 years ago. It was intended for a different audience, but it is how I will remember Paris. 
How do we capture such a profoundly gifted and unconventional thinker? Someone who writes, for example, I make phone calls to what are for me the most obscure, remote, and foreign regions of the Earth, Antarctic research bases, outposts in the Siberian tundra, nightclubs in Jakarta, hardware stores in the suburbs of Canberra, expensive restaurants in Cape Town, futuristic penthouses in Daiba, Tokyo, conversing with and learning from the anonymous concepts on the other end of the line. How does one reconcile such mediocre English grades from a student who writes of his passion for rock climbing? Growing up in a concrete jungle, there is nothing like the lonely dance of crimping through the crux of an overhanging shield of schist. Perhaps we turn to his classmates, who characterize him as inquisitive, self-aware, brilliant, a boiling pot of creativity, always ticking, never done, and so smart and clever I want to cry. Perhaps you recognize the intensely creative and intellectual upbringing with a British mother trained in the dramatic arts and a Romanian father schooled in architecture. You note that his primary years were spent at the New York City Lab School for Gifted Education. The deeper one looks, the more apparent it becomes that Paris is a young man of intense and eclectic passions. Even his volunteer activities are characteristically out of the ordinary. In the summer of 2003, for example, he was a production assistant for Colors of Ritual, a multimedia performance event presented by the International House of Trances. The event's description reads, from tribalism to technology through the trance music of the African and Jewish diaspora. Exceptionally bright, eccentric, eccentric, creative, and engaging, Paris is possessed of an uncanny insight into reading and an ability to wow his teachers and classmates with the remarkable acuity of his vision into difficult problems. He reads voraciously and can speak clearly and eloquently on a wide range of topics. Paris's creative writing talents are immense and his love for and understanding of the sound and subtleties of language are outstanding. His English Six teacher writes, Paris's original stories demonstrate a vivid imagination and an almost volcanic approach to language. The energy and imagery of his compositions have been impressive. Sometimes, however, the connection between the writing and the assignment is so fleeting or nebulous as to render it impossible to adequately assess. <laughs> Hence the disparity between his grades and his intellect. Paris is something of a stealth scholar. He tends to circle just below a teacher's radar screen until he's ready to swoop in. The effect can be quite dramatic. In Media and Reality, an interdisciplinary course in science, technology, and society, the teacher, that would be me, writes, Paris is my enigma, quite likely the most intellectually gifted student I have had in 30, now 41, years of teaching. He monitors every moment of class with the most intriguingly detached engagement letting others voice their perspectives, and then entering the intellectual fray by making a profound statement or posing a keen query that strikes to the very heart of the discussion. He digests the right reading, material, reading assignments, preferring, it seems, the meatier philosophical tomes to the lightweight fiction. Recently, he sent me an essay with a disclaimer I am not sure I did exactly what was intended. It was an intensely personal reflection that had virtually nothing to do with the assignment, but was nonetheless the most breathtakingly beautiful piece of prose I have ever received from a student. 
In our admittedly traditional pedagogical setting, therefore, Paris is a fish out of water. His immensely creative mind yearns for a freer, more worldly setting. He is an intellectual eagle hopping about in a cage, waiting for the opportunity to soar, and soar he will. Perhaps in the end, the only words that will do Paris justice are his own, for they come from his heart, his soul. And again, I quote him. And so I'm hoping that I've managed to leave enough of an impression of myself, whether it be perplexing, maddening, whimsical, perhaps a touch melancholy, that my academic image becomes less of a dicey enterprise and more of a leap of logic and faith, something that, when read slightly in between the lines, exposes itself as full of possibility. And we are expecting Mr. Andrew Finelli to speak. Everybody. <laughs> Paris Alexander Ionescu. Paris, I love you. We love you and I want to start by thanking you for all the gifts that you've given us. We all had the great fortune of knowing pleasure and privilege of knowing Paris. I know I became better because of my time with him at a time when I wasn't very cool. Paris invited me into his home and he turned me on to such wild stuff. Paris is the only true genius uh, I have ever known. I've said that countless times since meeting him in the sixth grade. Um, that was 1998 to 1999 in case anybody was wondering. We were both in Mr. Jones' homeroom, or Mr. J as well, uh, everyone called him. Paris is really the only genius I've ever known. I want to stress that because I, we throw words around like love and hate and genius, but he wasn't a genius in the way we tend to casually use words as if we know what we're saying. Paris Ionescu is a true genius. He had gifts and he was a gift to us all. Paris was exciting, he was complex. <sighs> he was so well-rounded, he was the new wheel. He had the closest thing that I've ever known to original thought. Paris's brilliance, however, was tempered by an astounding and exhilarating absurdity. We were both in our school's public speaking competition in the eighth grade. I chose to recite and act out excerpts of Seamus Haney's <laughs> Beowulf. I, I even recited uh, some in Old English from the original text, which still know to this day it's quite the party trick if you want to hear later. But Paris performed the path of the righteous man from, <laughs> from Pulp Fiction, and he performed that not because he was a biblical scholar, but 
because he thought Pulp Fiction was a badass movie. Parrish didn't need to perform or telegraph his brilliance. Every single thought of his was a pearl, a pearl he effortlessly cast before all of us. You couldn't fault a fool for not recognizing Paris's genius at first. He didn't beat you over the head with it. I'll always remember one simple, beautiful weekend at my grandparents' home in Amityville, Long Island. It was me, Enrique, and Paris. I remember we walked up Ocean Avenue to the end of the road, and there was a stretch of land contested by local government. I was across from the local Amityville swimming and sailing club that my grandparents belonged to, called Unqua Corinthian Yacht Club. Um, and this stretch of land was open and expansive and close to the water, and nobody really knew what to do with it. Well, this stretch of land was not barren, but it wasn't blooming either. And the three of us were wandering along, and all of a sudden, we saw a flower, one single solitary little flower. And Paris, like no other person could, began to speak about this flower. He exalted this flower. He found a way to speak about life in terms of this flower, and in that childish, half-serious, half-choking way, we all agreed that this flower was life. A perfect, pure, and poetic representation of life. The last night we shared together was Friday, December 11th. We met at Browning's holiday party and proceeded to have one of the most memorable nights I can remember in probably the past five years at least. Moments into meeting each other, he mentioned a story I just shared with you. I was overwhelmed to learn how that moment stuck with him. Paris is that flower, and while I don't want to say the world around him was a barren field, I will say he stood out for a reason. Paris is exceptional. But I'm not here to simply tell you he was a genius because we know that. Everyone here knows how staggeringly and shatteringly brilliant Paris was, and I mean shatteringly. His thoughts were so clear, so defined. His understanding of our world and reality was so sharp and precise. He could shatter, absolutely shatter everything you thought you knew about being. And when you put the pieces back together and understood what he understood, you had the clearest lens of your life through which you could view your world. My lens through which I view my world is as clear as it is because of my time with Paris. With that said, there is no way I can fully or adequately communicate who Paris is, but I can speak to how monumental and tremendous he is. I can speak to that because I owe so much of myself to Paris. I've been asking myself, um, what is the measure of a man? A lot of people have a lot of answers to that question, but for me personally, it's influence. We do what we can to cobble together a personality. We cling to signs and symbols and signifiers because we want people to understand something about who we are. And it's easy for us to claim we've been influenced by well-known, well-regarded people whom we've never actually met. Maybe there's even some pride in it. You're contextualizing yourself through terms you know other people are going to like. What isn't easy to say is to acknowledge how your peers have shaped you, because in doing so, you admit to your equality as living, breathing things. Well, Paris, uh, you gave me the gift of my personality. 
You influenced me. Parashinescu influenced me. We shared truly formative years with each other, years where we learned how to be ourselves. We had private, honest, inspiring, and seminal moments together. If you know me, you know my love for music, and you also know my challenging sense of humor. I owe so much of that to Paris. From Weezer to Pixies to Modest Mouse to Fortet to Os Mutanches. You like the pronunciation, right? Paris introduced me to sounds I had never heard before. He introduced me to sounds that shaped what I wanted to create with my band, Shapes. Paris was my first musical partner. He played drums in my Weezer cover band, which eventually became Shapes. And if you know me, you know that's how I defined myself completely for 10 solid years of my life. I remember when he first played Weezer's Only in Dreams for me. He prefaced it by saying, I listen to the song alone and cry. What a thing for one young boy to admit to another young boy. I fell in love with Paris Ionescu in that moment. I absolutely fell in love with him. For those of you who don't know the song, the back half of it is rather epic. <laughs> it's an atmospheric and evocative blend of feedback, overtones, undertones, and more musical theory I don't understand as well as Paris did. But the atmosphere builds, and through the clouds of sound, you hear individual notes building up and peeking out. It leads to a crescendo, which explodes into an epic outro of dueling guitars. It sounds like lovers who have been kept apart for years, who have finally found each other, and are now pulling at one another in a moment of rapture. It's epic, it's breathtaking. <laughs> and Paris had me convinced for years that this was an impossible bit of music to learn or recreate. He told me people had tried and failed miserably. It was only years later, after becoming better at guitar myself and the advent of YouTube, um, when I learned that that simply wasn't true. <laughs> it's a bit of music. It's a bit of music that can be played by anyone who is good enough and cares enough to learn it. Paris knew that. But Paris also knew that magic is important. And he sold me on the emotion of magic behind that recording. And sure, maybe that song isn't as impossible as he had me believing, but the magic was real. The magic is real. Paris introduced me to ideas, avenues of thought, and paths of logic I would never have found without him. Paris, I loved you, and still do love you. You influenced and inspired me. Every conversation with you was illuminating and ended up with me being smarter than I was before. So many great ideas of mine were lesser versions of thoughts or bits of music I heard from you. Paris saw the world for what it is. He understood what we do not and cannot. Paris taught me that while life may be real, nothing is true, and everything can be what you want it to be. I love you, Paris. For the past couple of weeks, I've been trying to remember as much as possible. Between emails, texts, photos, and my brain, there's a lot to dig through. And I'm starting to wonder why I keep digging. 
Am I trying to remember Paris, or am I not willing to admit that he's gone and still trying to engage with him on some level? I've also been trying to figure out what to write about. Paris was the most complex, impressive individual I ever met. It feels inconceivable to analyze him and superfluous to praise him. The moments that defined him were so subtle or so out there that they're difficult to put into words. And I worry that to write about Paris, I'd have to write like Paris, which is something I can't do. <laughs> the only concrete thing I've been able to latch onto is that exactly 10 years ago, Paris and I and two other friends at Bard made a website together. So I'm going to set aside my reservations and talk a bit about that. I met Paris at Bard freshman year. The semester hadn't actually started yet. We were part of a month-long orientation, cleverly designed to coerce new students into breaking the ice by discussing Kierkegaard. I remember thinking he'd accidentally shown up at the wrong school. He wore khakis, a button-down shirt, and the kind of rectangular framed glasses a tech guru would wear. He introduced himself to me as Paris, which seems totally appropriate. <laughs> we took art history classes together and would talk about how the internet was taking over everything but art. Many dorm room desk drawers of cigarette butts were filled over this, and other thoughts, parties, occasional tips. Paris had the unique quality of being at once bold and taciturn, which resulted in unpredictable, often hilarious behavior. He wouldn't just friend girls on Facebook, he'd write them two paragraph hellos. One week, our friend Jesse and I watched Apocalypse Now like five times, while Paris read in the background. He never complained to us, but later, when Jesse and I were at class, he cracked the DVD in half. <laughs> this was classic Paris. I wouldn't call him ambitious, more like curious and really proactive. When the three of us and our friend Theo thought up selfportrait.net, I was as excited about making billions of dollars as Paris was about dismantling the art world. Here's an excerpt from an email he wrote to Bard President Leon Botstein freshman year. I personally think the emergence of user-created content technologies of Internet 2 has vast implications for the art world, a central one being the ability to consider and critique art in a transparent, democratic, and consensus-based manner, freed from what I see as the increasingly antiquated, hegemonic methodologies of traditional art institutions. The Internet, globalized media, and all of postmodernity, if you wish, have effectively invalidated distinctions between high art and low art, and thus, a recontextualization of what is good, or what does good mean, is in order. <laughs> Self-portrait had all the qualities of a successful internet business, without actually being a successful internet business. <laughs> we had an office on 28th Street, cool business cards, an espresso machine. We spoke on panels at reputable art institutions and curated art shows at disreputable non-art institutions. <laughs> we didn't pay our interns, but one time we brought Maggie to my backyard in Cobble Hill and let her shoot us with paintballs. We deserved it. The website, which the four of us meticulously planned with no coding experience whatsoever, was terrible, but only objectively terrible. The quality of an artist was evaluated based on profile views, and there was no option to delete your account. <laughs> Paris viewed the site as disruptive, critical, groundbreaking. We took cues from, sent from French sociologist Henri Lefebvre. We'd pace around the dorm at 3 a.m. yelling, what if we put a chat room on the profile page? And one of us would say, yeah, whatever happened to chat rooms? And then we'd email the programmer. We bled cash. What started as a glamorous venture ended with me, Paris, and our new partner, Eddie, pitching the site to a famous hedge fund manager while he attended his kid's soccer game. We were in suits, even though the meeting took place over speakerphone. I don't think Paris or I were particularly bummed when we gave up on the site. The saddest part was that we had one less excuse to hang out. Anyone who knew Paris understood that he was liable to flake. In fact, 
He flaked so often, you could rely on him flaking, so I'm not even sure you could call it that. <laughs> this went on well before he suffered from addiction. You'd see him and both have an awesome time, and then he'd disappear for days to write something brilliant or binge watch TED Talks. But you wouldn't be angry, you'd just want to see him again, and when he did finally get back to you, it would be all the more exciting. This was part of his mystique. I'd like to believe that he is now collectively flaking on all of us which he is, in a sense, and it's cause for optimism. In true Paris fashion, the pain of his absence will be abruptly eclipsed by the irrepressible appreciation of having been his friend. Henry Scott Holland. Death is nothing at all. It does not count. I, hold on. I've only slipped away into the next room. Nothing has happened. Everything remains exactly as it was. I am I. You are you. And the old life that we lived so fondly together is untouched, unchanged. Whatever we were to each other, that we are still. Call me by my old familiar name. Speak of me in the easy way which you always used to. But put no difference in your tone. Wear no forced air of solemnity or sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed at the little jokes that we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. 
Let it be spoken without an effort, without the ghost of a shadow in it. Life means all that it ever meant. It is the same as it ever was. There is, abs there is absolute and unbroken continuity. What is this death but a negligible accident? Why should I be out of mind because I'm out of sight? I am but waiting for you for an interval, somewhere very near, just around the corner. I've known dear Paris his entire life, and so I feel I still know him, though he isn't walking amongst us anymore. Paris was so empathetic, sensitive, very intelligent, creative, and a loving young man. He played beautiful piano. He read Rilke to me in German. He loved to read extensively and adored music, and most of all, he was a thoughtful person. He was always aware of everything going on around him. As an eight-year-old, he was at my new apartment for a housewarming with his parents. I walked into my bedroom to find a crowd of men standing, trying to figure out the new cable and TV box to turn on the TV. All of a sudden, I see little Paris reach in, eight-year-old little arm, and presses a button, and everything came up. <laughs> and he just walked away. At the end of the party, my mother's trying to figure out the new dishwasher. Paris didn't even need to be invited. He just came over, pressed the button, and everything worked. He always knew what was needed, and he was always kind and ready to assist. Whenever his parents gave a party or a dinner, I would take off my coat at the door, and the first thing I would do is go to his room. And we'd have a rather long chat about life. This went on even when he was very small. It became a lovely habit, and it brought us closer together. I would ask him about his feelings, about his experiences. He was the most articulate little boy. And as he grew older, the conversations were even more profound and deeply satisfying because his mind could fly so easily to the edges of thought and experience and look back and see the world in his own nuanced way as if he were a much older person. I'm his godmother. He chose me to be his godmother on his 10th birthday. Asking his mother first, what does a godmother mean? Always looking for meaning, even at 10 years old. And when Caroline described a godparent's duty was as a spiritual guide, he asked her if he could have two godmothers, the one that baptized him, who lived in London, and me. Caroline in Paris came to my home, and he asked me formally to be his godmother. I was very touched at the request, and of course, I accepted. Paris was always very warm and demonstrative with me, and I loved that about him. But one day, when he was about 14, Caroline, Dan, and I went to pick him up at the Chelsea Piers, where he was skateboarding with some friends, to go to see a movie with us. We arrived, and he stood in a line with his friends and their skateboards, and he didn't greet me as he usually did with a hug. Oh, I didn't say anything. The boys decided to see another film altogether, and we older folks were about to leave and go and see our film, when I turned and I motioned to Paris, and I said I wanted to have a word. He came up to me and I looked at him and I said, well, I just wanted to say goodbye to you. And he looked at me and he said, where are you going? And I said, no, where are you going? He said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, you're at the age where your hormones are raging and you're just gonna wanna see your peers so you won't care to see the old farts anymore. So the adults will not be in the picture. I'll see you in a couple of years. And I walked away and his mouth was hanging open. <laughs> a year and a half later, I had an annual, my annual Christmas dinner and Paris was seated on my left talking to another person when suddenly he turns to me and he touches my arm and he says, I'm back. <laughs> and it gave, he gave me that smile, you know. He remembered what I'd said a year and a half ago. A small thing perhaps, but very profound for one so young. Dear Paris will always remain with me as a beautiful soul who touched my heart and my mind and continues to do so every day. I'm comforted by the fact he's just around the corner waiting.
perhaps have told you to stand. I think sitting through these long uh, hours of celebration can be a little uncomfortable in these hard pews. So hymns in Welsh church are always sung whilst standing. Um, we turn now to three more eulogies and we start with Lola Kramer. December 7th, 2013. Read Nietzsche's bio in my break today. Realized our thought trajectories have a lot in common. I'm pretty sure now that I'm destined to make a mark with my ideas. All the things, all the things, Paris. Look at us blunderers. All our industry, all our magnitude. The erotic, the poetic, and the dumb. All not for the stellar fact that none of us has control over what we are, nor can we guess at what we are not, or say with Scout's honor that done again we do anything different. The sky so sprent with ancient beacons, yet there is our lodestar. And that is not the rub. Here's the rub. To transcend all illusions, all fabrications, that make tolerable and let us survive the most unsavory facts. To have absolute control would untether us from the moorings of our self-limited selves. According to Italian philosopher Carlo Michael Steder, just before his own death, he said, quote, let us love our limitations, for without them, nobody would be left to be somebody. That was written by Paris in December of 2012. Uh, my name is Lola, and I loved Paris very much. Um, the moment I met him, I knew he was a prince. At the end of my first date with Paris on Avenue A, he walked with me to the train, and when he heard that I had no plans for Thanksgiving, as my parents live in California, he invited me to eat with him and his own parents at the National Arts Club. I thought that was very fancy. Uh, before we parted, I remember feeling surprised when he gave me a kiss on the cheek. But the funny expression on his face showed that he was also surprised. Um, I remembered thinking, wow, who is this guy? Uh, he is like no one I have ever known. After dinner uh, at the National Arts Club, he told his parents that we were going to go outside early and go on a walk. Once we were outside, walking towards Union Square, he held my hand and said he needed to tell me something. I remembered my heart stopped, and I thought, this guy that I don't even know is about to tell me something that will be incredibly painful to hear. I asked him what's going on. And I remember staring, him staring straight ahead, unable to look at me, but still squeezing my hand. He finally looked into my eyes and told me that he did not think he was going to tell me this before, but decided that it wouldn't be fair if I didn't know. He told me that he was in recovery from drug addiction and that he understood if I could not see him anymore. I felt like a rug was pulled under, from under my feet. We parted, and I went home. When I was alone, I began to cry. I was crying because I understood that I had already signed up. I was already in love with Paris Sainescu. The thing is, sometimes we do things even though we know it will bring us extreme pain because we have the foresight to see that it will forever change us. Paris was one of the greatest minds I have ever known. If he had stuck around longer, he would have figured out a way to share his work in a very profound way. Paris had an incredible gift to catch strands of intrigue from many different contexts and weave them together into something very acute. The morning after I met him, I began writing feverishly, and what came out was astoundingly unlike anything I had ever written before. 
It was as if this golden, glittering way of conception that he had had rubbed off onto me. Being with Paris was like having some wondrous mentor who recognized something special in me and probably in each of you too. He brought something very brilliant out of all of his friends. We would read to each other every day, share big plans and fears. Once we even snuck into the MoMA Gala from a stuffy opening on the other side of the museum through the kitchen. He was the Prince of New York. He taught me how to rock climb on Central Park Schist, and at one point we began to go on runs from his house through the park to the Met, even when it was snowing. We would run all the way to the entrance where we would pay a quarter to enter in our jogging gear and wet hair. We would stretch amongst the busts in the ancient Greek and Roman sculpture garden and head back out through the Temple of Dendor and pick up on our run again back on Fifth Avenue, down the street and into his home and his room where we would talk and write about organizing exhibitions and making reading groups. At one point, we decided to make it a part of our routine to go to uh, the Bruce High Quality Foundation University. Uh, those of us who, part who participated in these discussions or any reading group with Paris uh, knows that when he spoke, he was adding something very unique to the conversation. In this way, he gave me, sh me confidence to share my own ideas with others. It is thanks to Paris that I have many of the thoughtful and intellectually challenging relationships that I do today. I will never forget how he would play me compositions that he wrote on the piano as I was getting ready for work in the morning. In a way, he was alienated by his intelligence, and he never quite found the right moment to put it all together. If he had lived, I would have liked to tell him how brilliant he was, and how every word he wrote was a gossamer strand of thought how divine it was to read and how it made me want to write more. I would have liked to tell him how much I admired him and how important he is to me. I remember one night shortly after we met when we shared our fears of dying with one another. I was leaving for a month-long trip to India and we had just fallen in love. The day after, he sent me an email that I will share with you now. Dear Lola, I'm glad you were honest with me last night about some of your fears. I have had the same fears in fluctuating intensities ever since I was a kid, and they always fulminate when something you really want to hold on to comes along. For me, it's then that the irrevocable pull of time, the necessity of change, and the fallibility of memory seem to form a vexing, hopeless retort to that desire for stillness. But if we accept this dilemma as the very same set of conditions which brought along the person or thing that captures the attention and heart in the first place, it may be bittersweet, but can at least remind us to savor every moment and sensation. And for right now and beyond, everything I know of points to the fact that there is nothing to worry about at least not for us. There will be an end to all things, but it won't be for a long time. And it won't be in one fell swoop. And I do believe we have enough of a degree of power over how and when these things come to term, that we have a good reason to keep our heads and not give in to cynicism or absolutes of pure self-preservation. I think we work hard. We try to commune with the beautiful, the mysterious, and the challenging, and all the while try to be good people, and that can be lonely sometimes. But I think that as a result, people like us are subtly drawn to one another. Glad you were drawn to me the same as I was to you, Paris. When anyone would ask, about Paris, ask Paris about his approach to life as a philosopher and his life's quest to explore notions of the absolute, 
He would say, quote, being a philosopher is about learning how to live and learning how to die. Paris Ionescu, you certainly left a mark on me. Thank you. Paris, oh Paris, what would I have done without you? Your gentle diplomacy, your quirky dry wit, your patience, your gumption, your advice. In so many ways, you were the sage that this city so desperately needed, that we all needed. Frequently, Paris and I would write next to each other in his bedroom. Sometimes we worked together, sometimes we worked alone. But after a few hours of draining silence, while clicking and clacking at our computers, Paris would always be the one to give us both new life. On one such occasion, I remember him showing me a drawing. As many of you know, Paris was a brilliant artist, an artist in the truest sense of the word, really. His drawings, his music, his writing, all of it had a panache that was almost otherworldly. It made you say, how on earth did you think of that? And this drawing was no different. The piece of paper he held up depicted a heraldic underwater battle. There on the page, a posse of scuba divers were in the midst of harpooning a whale shark. A whale shark who was feverishly protecting a glittery chest of sunken treasure. What distinguished this drawing from your average doodle, however, was the fact that this whale shark was wearing a specific article of clothing. That article was a sweater vest, and knit across its chest was written one word, Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer. The 19th century German philosopher, revived as a treasure-guarding whale shark assaulted by a bevy of harpoonsmen. Does it get any better than that? Dissertations could be written about the cartoon, books even. And yet Paris seemed to whip it up out of thin air as if it were nothing. He made it look so easy. Everything so easy. Paris was the only person I've ever seen play Smells Like Teen Spirit upside down on the guitar. As a lefty, he taught himself to command the instrument from both sides. How he did this, I still have no idea. Honestly, I have no idea how Paris did a lot of the things he did. Like how he could comment on a YouTube video and manage to win over a seemingly infinite gang of video trolls. If you've never experienced it, the comment section of YouTube is basically the nuclear minefield of the internet. Everyone is always livid about something. But Paris had this rare ability to come in, post a few intelligently crafted sentences, and disarm the torch and pitchfork wielding townsfolk. If you get a chance, he often wrote under the username dental appointment, one word, And if you can find him, it will well be worth your time, I promise. It was this congeniality, the one which eased the anger of the internet, that Paris also brought to the real world. He was my confidant, the person I gave my manuscripts to first, the person whose opinion mattered most to me. These are just a handful of the little things I remember about Paris every day, the inspiring moments that make me laugh and cry on the inside. But more than anything, Paris was the person who saved my life. Five years ago, the two of us were rock climbing upstate along the Shawangunk Ridge in the Catskill Mountains. We were doing a certain type of climbing called bouldering, which for safety involves placing a foam pad on the ground instead of using ropes and harnesses. The idea is that one person spots the other person, guiding them to the crash pad if the climber happens to fall. Bouldering is meant to be performed low to the ground, going no higher than 10 or 12 feet. This was a mistake that I made. After struggling for a hold, I slipped at about 20 feet and started to fall back first towards a jagged and sharp landing. I had veered off to the right and was going to miss the crash pad. Instantly, both of us were in a panic. But thanks to Paris's quick thinking, I'm still standing here today. In a flash, he hurtled himself at me, arms outstretched, 
sacrificing his body to save mine. And miraculously, he hit me with enough force that most of my body made it onto the foam mat. I ended up breaking my foot from the fall, but it could have easily have been my neck if it weren't for Paris. After we both finally got to our feet, Paris quietly helped me hobble the half mile back to the car. He neither chastised me for my recklessness nor sung praises for his heroics. We just walked back quietly. In the years that followed, he never mentioned the incident. To me, that day exemplified Paris in his rawest form, a silent savior. He didn't expect anything in return for his kindness. He simply did what he did because he didn't know any other way. This was the selfless and adventurous Paris who stood out from everyone else. The person who, a month ago, applied to the Royal Marines because he sought to be of a greater service to the world. The person who delivered food to the hungry. The person who couldn't help but help out a friend. The person who saved my life. Paris was the person who saved my life. I just wish I could have returned the favor. I think we're having a technical glitch playing Paris's grandfather's recording, so maybe we can let the technician rewind it and we'll come back to it during the later period. At this point, we are turning to a reading of scripture um, and preparing for a brief homily from the retired minister of the Welsh Church, but who is happy to be here with us today to celebrate a, a remarkable young life. Um, I ask you to turn, if you wish, to the Bibles in your pew, to the Epistle to the Romans, chapter 8, starting at verse 31. So then, what are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus, who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced 
that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Accept, O Lord, thanks, our thanks, and praise for the mercy and gifts for us. We thank you for the splendor of the world and the beauties of the human mind and soul. We especially thank thee for the excitement of life and the mystery of love. Let us repeat together the Lord's Prayer. I am thought Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commit thy service and thy servant, Paris. Acknowledge, we beseech thee, a sheep of your own flock, a lamb of your own farm. Receive him into the arms of mercy and grant him everlasting peace and wit and the multiplicity of his agenda. We commend him to you and we bless these ashes. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, in the sure and certain hope that his spirit lives 
in many of us. David has just read Romans 8, Paul, the author of Romans 8, was trying to impress Romans and as he had impressed so many in Asia and uh, Asia Minor. But Rome was a different story and he had to be on his best and deepest behavior. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. This is a gathering of a community newly formed by love, not death, love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, since God is love. Why else are we here? Since God is love and each of us love Paris as God's lettuce and will to have. Look around you, we have this community we are here because of Paris and Caroline, his mother. We are here because of Paris and because of God and God's love, which he showed in multiplicity ways through Paris. We're all here because of Paris and because of God and God's love. The opposite of love is not hate, despite the Republican politicians. <laughs> it is fear, the opposite of love is fear. And somewhere else in the Bible, I can't tell you where, it says, perfect love casts out fear. Paris wasn't afraid of much he wasn't afraid to come and hear me preach. <laughs> we are all here because of Paris and because of God and God's love let us love Paris in our own way. The opposite of love is not fear. Perfect love, God's love, casts out fear. So the Bible and so life. There are many ways 
to die young, accidentally, mysteriously, Caroline has just joined the company of ex those who have experienced the love of a son or daughter too young. There are many ways to die young and I challenge you to not think about the way Paris died. God's work with Paris was done. But this community, who will take up Paris's quixotic and winsome agenda. Besides this community who loved him and were influenced by him, I count myself amongst those who is eager to take up Paris's gender and his work according to God. God wanted in him more than we did. He must have been something real special. But we have his agenda to fulfill. And remember, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So we in this community have a gift from God by way of Paris. The beauty of his person and the elegance of his spirit will drive us to meet each other in new ways, deeper ways, deeper ways. For those who grieve his loss, especially his mother, Caroline, the community in its sadness celebrates the gift to us, a newly formed community, of Paris. For those who grieve his loves, we can only offer support and affirmation and love and embraces and stay in touch. When we leave this place, emboldened by the sadness of our loss, and you heard a few testimonies to the loss of this community. When we leave here, emboldened by the sadness of great loss. 
we offer you such support that we can give. We assure you that we meet as deeper persons because of Paris, because of your loss, and we ourselves are bearers, whether we like it or not, of God's love. We can only aspire to the perfect love that casts out fear. But remember, perfection is the enemy of the good. And so we will offer whatever we can to each other and to Carolyn and to his family. In nothing be anxious. The Lord of love is at hand. Amen. We are very, very pleased that a young pianist by the name of Bolai Kao is now going to play for you and us uh, Debussy's Clair de Lune. I think this was Paris's favorite piece. Uh, happens to be a lot of our favorite piece, but please enjoy this.
It is a custom of this congregation to turn to those near you, around you, and ask for God's blessings on each and every one of us and exchange some gesture of peace and consideration for who we are as people, mourning and sad. Please stand and greet those around you with a sign of peace of God. Tang never do a vogadani orch, an hour a cambith.
We bring this worship hour to a close, singing what is actually Wales' second national anthem. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Hymn number 281 in the bulletin. The second verse will be sung in Welsh by the choir, but we invite you all with gusto and enthusiasm to, to sing this hymn which, which Paris would have enjoyed as he did go to the uh, Red Lion Inn <coughs> uh, to watch Welsh rugby. Um, please join in. It's an appropriate gesture of triumph and success and completion. Thank you. some thoughts for you all.
sorry, just working out the technical details a little bit. Diolch yn fawr iawn i chi gyd am ddod, ac i eglwys y Cymru Efrog Newydd am cynnal y gwthau naeth hon. A diolch yn arbennig i Mary Nelson ac i'r cwr a ddaeth yn hyd yn wybodol i Gymru Tran yr oedfa. Thank you all so, so much for being here for our family and especially for Paris. I know quite a few of you have flown in from California and we really appreciate that. I would also like to thank the Welsh Church of New York City for offering to host this memorial service and for helping me to put it together. And a special thanks to Mary Nelson, our music director and organist, and to the members of the choir who came together especially for this service. I feel a tremendous amount of love here. Love for me, love for my husband, love for our family, and love for our beautiful son, Paris. Paris is my love. He was gentle, he was kind, he cared about people and injustice. He taught me philosophy, walked me through online lectures in quantum physics from Oxford and MIT, which I then had to compare, played me music, made me playlists, and recommended and queued up foreign films for me to watch. We shared bloodlines and Bloody Marys and went to rock concerts and rock climbing, his passion. He loved coming with me here to the Welsh Church, although I suspect it was talk to talk philosophy with Dr. Newell. And he was happy to help pour the tea and serve the Christmas punch, as we heard. And we'd like to invite you all to share some strong Welsh tea, which we'll probably need after this, and traditional Welsh cakes, and to sign the guest book in the room adjoining the sanctuary after the service. Although no longer present in the physical world, I believe, and I know, that Paris is with us in spirit, and for all we know, maybe standing right here beside me, holding my hand. And I kind of bet anything that he really is, we just can't see him. At the very least, he will remain in our hearts, in our minds, in our memories, and under our skin always. If there are any of you who would like to say a few words for or about Paris, please feel free to come up come forward. I guess you can call it open mic. Hi, my name is Selby. Um, when Caroline mentioned this open mic part, I didn't, I thought about uh, what I could say, and I had exactly the same problem that Johnny had, which was that Paris was not a grand person. Uh, so many of his most brilliant moments were so uh, subtle and intimate, and it felt strange really to talk about anything Paris did in this kind of a forum. Um, and actually, I found some piano recordings that he did, and I thought of like standing here like John Cusack and just like playing it for three minutes and then I thought that was a bad idea. But um, I do want to say to Dan and to Caroline how much I love you both because you guys were a family to me. Um, you welcomed me with such open arms at a time when I'd never, I'd never seen a family like that and I'd never seen people be so kind to each other and honor each other with rituals like you guys did. And um, and Par there was so much of both of you in Paris. Paris really wanted to be like both of you, and I don't know if you know that, but um, he, when we, w I was very close with Paris at a time when um, we were both young, but we were on the, we, we were graduate, it was the end of college, and then we were graduating college, and 
we lived in Copenhagen together and like set up an apartment and basically we were just kids pretending to be adults and playing house and figuring out what it looked like to put it all together and Paris did so much of what you, I remember from your home and from your home upstate and you know took out like we were living in this tiny apartment and had like no money but he would insist on going out and buying cheeses and wine and like putting it out on a cheese board and like we didn't have a dining room table or anything um, and, and, and honoring both of you guys and, um, and I just wanted to make sure you know that you don't you, you know, you, we've lost Paris, but you have, you know, you have all of us, or your kids, me and uh, Lola and Johnny and Mitch and Eddie and Andrew and, you know, those people who I know, Andrew Berardi and the Berardi family send their love, so we're all your kids forever, and uh, we all love Paris and we're here to talk about him. Um, I just wanted to read, this is like, it's cheesy, but uh, I was reading old things and I found... He wrote me this email on March 2011, um, and the last paragraph, like I, everyone's talked about what a genius Paris was, and uh, I, I was also very in awe of his mind, um, and like the poetry he could bring to any, he had such huge ideas that he brought to every tiny moment. Um, and. Like, I remember, like, we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do with our lives, and we graduated college, and we were just, like, wanted to be something so bad, and, you know, we, everything we talked about felt so important, but we had no idea how to get started, and, like, we just were lying on the bed one day in July after we graduated, like, unemployed. We'd been, like, writing and curating, and, like, I, you know, um, I thought, at that time, I thought self-portrait was, like, very impressive and successful, <laughs> so it's weird to, <laughs> to hear you say it wasn't. Like, I, I was impressed. Um, and I just remember looking at him being like, what do we do now? And he was like, I know, frozen lemonade. <laughs> and that was like the most genius thing I'd ever heard. Anyway, I just want to read this thing that I, like I never, okay, all right, I'm just gonna read this email. That he, at the end of this email, he said on a note, we hadn't been talking that much and I, he was just sort of catching me up. Um, and he said, on a note of more levity, I'm in the MoMA trivia, the MoMA trivia challenge for Art Forum's team tomorrow, yay me. Except guess what? I don't care about art, or politics, or philosophy. Music I like. That, and banging nails in a barn, watering marigolds, violas, and pansies, and the children of the future naturally, and stars. Still braving it, yours, Paris Alexander, UNESCO. Can I just wait one second? Oh, because I want to make sure he's got the recording ready oh, he's after this. Hi, I'm Annabelle, and um, Paris is my high school boyfriend. <laughs> I just want to say that I'm sending you and Dad so much love. Sorry, sorry. Um, that I have so many happy... memories. Um, I just wanted to share a few. Um, afternoons in Central Park, playing piano together, me very badly, Paris very well. Prom night, all that came before. Prom night with all of our friends from Browning and Chapin. Um, weekends in Bethel with Caroline and Dan, where we would play records in Paris's room and spend, enjoy long meals on the porch. Um, we would shoot BB guns at leaves that we would pre-select as targets and drive around for hours exploring. Um, nights we would spend in New York in his bedroom listening to music that he would teach me about. Um, all of the stories he would tell me I wasn't always sure if all of them were true, but it didn't really matter because they could have been. And, you know, Paris taught me about philosophy and, and, and possibility at a time that it was really important for me to learn about those things. And he really turned me on to so many intellectual endeavors. And he taught me that anything that I want could be possible in some version of the truth. 
um, Paris and I lost touch in the past years, um, other than the, you know, one-off emails or calls. Um, but after I learned that he had passed away, I spent days looking through everything, trying to cobble together a memory of him and something tangible to hold on to, um, photographs, letters, articles of clothing that I might have had of his, and um, emails and cards. And I came across a Facebook message, one of his preferred forms of communication that he had sent me last year that um, I unfortunately hadn't previously read. And it's so short, but for me it's meaningful and something I'll hold on to, so I'll read it. Um, he said, hey, this past um, February, hey, you look great and happy. I don't know why I'm writing, but wanted to remind us that even if we don't talk, we're always going to know each other. You said that to me once, and it's true. And I do know that that's true, and that I will always know Paris, and I will always think of him and all of the times we had. Peter, we're ready with the, my father's eulogy recorded. My 90-year-old father, Paris and I, celebrated his birthday with him last May in Bologna. And he decided that if he could manage to record on his iPad his eulogy, that that perhaps would be a bit better than flying all the way here and back in a weekend. So. Over to you, thank you. I am Tom Leach, father of Caroline and grandfather of Paris, whose brief life we are here to celebrate today. What should I say to those here who were more fortunate than I? and able to see him day by day, rather than, at best, a few moments or twice a year visits to America. Yet neither is a measure of bonds or affection, and the gap he leaves is just as true. It had, however, the advantage that our relationship developed not through domestic tedium as in the Victorian novels, <laughs> but through a series of well-remembered milestones. There was our visit to Jersey City after a frugal continental airlines had introduced me to Mrs. T's Bloody Mary ladies, driving about alcohol. And I had decided that it would make a very good gazpacho. <laughs> when the four and a half year old passed his judgment, this is excellent. We knew he was destined to continue the family's literary tradition. On the occasion of collections from primary school and then driving, the adolescent began to demonstrate his good taste by spurning the trivia and stopping to gaze at more artistically displayed words. More importantly, philosophical discussions developed as we risked on public park benches to probe each other's minds. Graduation and part was an introduction to the true American collegiate system. The richly displayed wealth of the parents was beginning to be matched by the achievements of their progeny. Someone had clearly been hard at work 
serve one more time in sympathy with the pressing words of Quadri's heroes, Leonardo da Vinci. All the time I thought I was beginning to live, I had been learning how to die. There is no direct evidence, but I suspect his lively appreciation of the arts was influenced by the inchoate, the all inspired by beauty and the unspoken tragedies within it. His master's thesis also bore that imprint. It ended with the primary relationship of possible impossible, which was beginning to resolve itself in historical terms. He saw as fatally limited by the complexities impeding our ability to act and take advantage of the results already achieved. Given time, he would have been able to overcome this impasse with the recognition that, however improbable, <coughs> mankind's progress had at critical moments been promoted by its willingness to subject itself to laws and restraints of its own making. But in our somber mood today, we should not assume that all his life was beset with torment and uncertainty. On the contrary, there is overwhelming evidence of wit and gaiety which shine also through some of his writings. I have an hilariously earnest piece of spoof literary criticism of the prep school novel as a genre. And memories of Halloween and Frank's girl. He had the gift of communication, both literary and oral, especially when free of social inhibitions. He loved to chat with Darwin and Ikes and I suspect, like St. Francis preaching to the birds, to try out his ideas for an accessible philosophy. <coughs> and then his smile. George Eliot said, they are never dead until we have forgotten. That alone, brave and beloved young Paris, will ensure that you remain with us for the rest of our days. Thank you. The next song is one that Paris frequently broke into at the end of his improvisational piano pieces, which many of you are very familiar with. It's by the Zombies, and it's called This Will Be Our Year. Our soloist is David Kelso, but if you know it, 
and would like to join in, please do so. Cariad a bendithion and a vlwyddyn newydd hon a bob amser. Love and blessings in this new year and always. Thank you. Warmth of your love's like the warmth from the sun And this will be our year Took a long time to come Don't let go of my hand Now the darkness has gone This will be our year Took a long time to come And I won't forget The way you held me up when I was down And I won't forget the way you said, darling, I love you, you gave me faith to go on. Now we're there, and we've only just begun. This will be our year, it took a long time to come. The warmth of your smile, smile for me little one and this will be our year it took a long time to come you don't have to worry all your worry days are gone and this will be our year it took a long time to come and I won't forget the way you helped me up when I was down and I won't forget the way you said Darling, I love you, you gave me faith to go on Now we're there, and we've only just begun This will be our year, took a long time to come And this will be our year, took a long time to come call on Dr. Newell to issue a benediction before we all go into the room adjoining for a sumptuous Welsh tea. It will be enticing for everyone. the God of love and the God of peace remain with you and remind you of this day and Paris's spirit in times to come. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost be upon you and remain with you always.